So the slides are up. Um, so this is about technology, but it's about so much more. Uh, technology is a small piece of, of what, what it takes to build a smart city. And what we're calling our presentation today is uh, Cities and Transportation Infrastructure, a Texas-sized opportunity to improve the quality of life of citizens. And that's powered by some superpower technologies that we'll talk to a little bit. But before we get to that, we'd like to kind of set the stage a little bit. I'm sure all of you are smart cities and transportation professionals, and uh, you've, you've, you live and breathe this stuff. But I'd like to just kind of come back and set a little bit of context before we get into uh, the technology portion of this. OK, so, so this, this chart sh sort of shows uh, the growth of population over time. Um, you'll see the hockey stick there. Well, actually, OK, there you go. So the hockey stick there that happened around, you know, oh, it's coming in and out. OK, uh, around the 15, 1600s, and there's this sharp, sharp uptick in how many of us occupy the globe. So uh, it took us about uh, a couple of hundred thousand years, uh, is what they tell me, for us to, for humanity to get to uh, what the first billion people on Earth. From there, it went up pretty rapidly. I don't know if the clicker is working here. Yeah. User error. <laughs> Does not seem to be, there you go, okay. All right, so, so it took a couple hundred thousand years to get to the first billion. The second and third billion happened in uh, 123 years and 33 years respectively. We're just, yeah, there's more and more of us on the planet. So, so that's, that's great, there's a lot of people. Uh, this also implies that cities have grown in terms of the number of cities, the size of cities, six cities with a million plus people. Uh, in the 1500s, going to 12 cities in the, in the 1800s, 488 cities with a million plus population. So you start to see the scale and the, just the enormity of, of sort of the, some of the challenges as well as the opportunities that are in front of us uh, with, with this spectacular growth. So that growth brings challenges. So we're all familiar with uh, a lot of the challenges that we face in cities related to congestion, <coughs> related to uh, safety is related to environmental concerns, so, so traffic jams and, and just, you know, air pollution. Uh, my understanding is that about 70 to 80 percent of people on the globe <coughs> living in cities are exposed to air pollution levels that are higher than what the what, what environmental agencies recommend. So it's, it's uh, lots of challenges in front of us. Uh, the last couple of years, we've been dealing with, with COVID-19. We've been dealing with all the variants, variants of concern, all this, all this stuff. Uh, we're pulling through. We're, we're coming out of it uh, despite some challenges. But that's an additional concern of, of uh, large numbers of people living together in cities that we need to be cognizant of, that we need to plan for, prepare for. However, uh, you still have a huge appeal that cities hold for people. So cities offer access to education, better health care, better, more opportunity. A lot of us gravitate to cities because of all of these reasons to kind of connect with each other, to work together, to innovate, all, all these sorts of things. So, so cities continue to grow, to, to thrive. Uh, now, the challenges in front of us, the, the sort of the good news is that, that globally, uh, the governments and, and just organizations, this, the EU, the US, China, India, these are some numbers that, that are related to uh, investment in infrastructure that's expected that has been approved in these different uh, parts of the world. So we're all familiar with the infrastructure bill here in the US that got signed into law. We're all excited about the opportunity that it presents to, to folks in the in the smart cities and transportation sort of space. Uh, you could think of it as we were talking about it the other day and a, a colleague of mine described it as a once in a generation, once in a career type of 
opportunity to improve outcomes, to improve lives. So, so uh, governments throughout the world have sort of uh, uh, really recognized the need to, to invest in infrastructure to do more, and these numbers are telling. And that those are trillions, obviously, which is, you know, it's, it's just pretty amazing to see this happening. <coughs> uh, and we believe that, you know, smart cities as, a, as, as sort of a, a term has been around for some decades now, but it's really starting to gain momentum these last several years and with, with these sorts of investments that are coming in the U.S. and around the globe, uh, there, there's a lot to be expected in terms of just the opportunity to do better outcomes. So a couple of quick slides on the infrastructure bill. I'm sure that many of you have been studying this closely and are looking at this. These couple of slides are from um, some quick work that, uh, that McKinsey put out. So 1.2 trillion, about 550 billion is expected to be new spending. Uh, roughly a little more than half of it is, is expected to go into transportation uh, related, related investments. Uh, 266 billion uh, towards core infrastructure. So uh, this, this is again, this amazing, we're, we're all looking at it closely to see how this all works out and where, uh, how much time and where, where it gets uh, you know, allocated to and so on and so forth we can respond, uh, we can all uh, team up and respond appropriately and, and use the money as efficiently, as effectively as possible. Uh, this is a breakdown of the transportation portion on the left-hand side, so that square <laughs> block diagram that you see kind of shows how the transportation spending is going to get lit up. So if you look at roads, bridges, major projects, uh, that's about 110 billion. Uh, passenger and freight rail, that's about 66 billion. Airports and ports and waterways, 42 billion. Public transit is 39 billion. So these are big, big numbers. There's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a huge expectation of, you know, what could be done with, uh, with this funding. Uh, we've, we've all sort of seen the, you know, it's, it's always been a challenge. There's private-public partnerships, there's, there's ways that cities, uh, you know, many, many mechanisms to raise funding, and this is, this, is a, this is a wonderful opportunity. The chart on the right is a, uh, is, it's a selected chart. There were six or so, we just picked one of these to kind of show how these uh, monies are being, uh, are expected to be disbursed at the, at the state level. And this particular chart shows roads and bridges. Darker is better. So you see California and Texas as the standouts here in terms of the money that uh, is expected to be spent uh, on these two states. And that's, uh, I believe, my understanding is, and some of you may know this better than I do, but I believe it's formula-based, looking at the infrastructure, the size of the state, the infrastructure, the, the miles of highways, and so on and so forth. But the net-net is that uh, there's a lot of opportunity to, to do a lot of things in Texas. Point likes this slide. <laughs> now try. Did I do it? Can you can you do it from there, perhaps? There it goes. So as the, as the bill rolls out, as we think about physical infrastructure, physical infrastructure is of course critical. Right? We all drive on roads, we go into airports and so on. So physical infrastructure is, is, is key. Uh, but what we also need to consider, especially at this point in time with, with all the mature technologies that are available, is digital infrastructure. So it's a key complement to physical infrastructure out there. So it'll better outcomes with, uh, with things like IoT and 5G and AI and, and so on and so forth. So as, as, as you consider your plans, as you think about what types of things need to get done, uh, I, would, I would say that uh, digital infrastructure is going to be a key, key component and uh, it needs to be really comprehended as part and parcel of the rollout of the build out. Uh, without digital infrastructure, 
uh, we'll all be missing a, a tremendous opportunity here to, uh, to help better outcomes. So as we think about smart cities and transportation, it's one of these buzzwords, right? It's, it's kind of everything in the kitchen sink. But if you really break it out a little bit, it's, it's roadways, it's the environment and sustainability, it's, it's public health, it's public safety, railways, seaports, university campuses, you get, you get the idea, right? So, so any sort of physical infrastructure where you're building things out, where you're, where you're looking for better outcomes, for more efficiency, for, for uh, all these sorts of things. So it, it all gets sort of captured into this, this catch-all phrase of smart cities and transportation. So the, the message here is that as, as uh, this build out, as this infrastructure gets developed, uh, it's across all of these different types of venues that you'll want to think about uh, looking at digital infrastructure and about improving citizen outcomes. Okay. So the um, core technologies that can really help at a, at, a, at a kind of a high level, right? And this is, this is sort of a, uh, a, a, it's a kind of a cut and paste from something that our CEO, Pat Gelsinger, has been talking about now for some months, ubiquitous compute. So everything that we do, everything, if you're working at home, if you're working at work, if you're, if you're using your phone, you know, there's, there's that compute that is absolutely necessary, right? Pervasive connectivity. 60% of us today are connected to the internet and have pervasive connectivity. My understanding is that the data points show that in about, uh, in, by 2030, that number is going to be 90%. So we're looking at some, some tremendous change here in terms of how, how we connect to the internet, how we have a significant that In terms of number of people, you know, seven billion people with pervasive connectivity. Uh, cloud to intelligent edge. So uh, we all in the tech sector, uh, about 10 years ago, we started to the cloud. There's amazing opportunity. It's coming up today. I saw a snippet about how people have access to the largest supercomputer in the world, which is the cloud, right? You can look at you know, what ecosystem to support end customers. So this is a uh, little data point that uh, we actually pulled together for, for this particular talk. So uh, AI yesterday and today. So again, AI has been around for a long time. 2011, uh, this, is, this is, to me, this was interesting as, as we were working on putting this together. Uh, so in 2011, for the first time, an AI-based neural network recognized traffic sig signals better than human beings, all uh, better by 0.24%. So it was just, 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 just on par or slightly better than the, than the human eye, than the human brain could, could perceive these, uh, these, these traffic signs, right? That was 2011. Now today, uh, and this is a Phoenix example, uh, AI is powering their traffic intersections, 40% reduction in vehicle delays, uh, real-time road and asset tracking, safer, more efficient uh, intersections, and uh, lower, lower fatalities. 
So it's yes, I can do that. Okay, people in the room, you might want to just cover your ears in the meantime. Okay, so so uh, the point is, it's, it's just a tremendous rate of change in a decade to see this sort of change that has uh, been brought about uh, with technology, right? And specifically around AI. So underneath all of this technology, underneath these solutions, the end-to-end -end solutions, the offerings from, from our partners, from OEMs, et cetera, uh, there's, there's Intel ingredients, and these ingredients are offered from end to end, so from the edge to the network core to the cloud. Uh, and we believe that we offer them with performance, with, with security, scalability, reliability that you've all come to sort of expect, right? And we, we, it's an Intel presentation. We've got to talk about Moore's Law. So Moore's Law, uh, there's, there's this continued sort of, you know, every year, year and a half, right? About a year and a half, you see this huge improvement. And uh, if, if it was any other industry, you'd see huge commensurate price increases, but you don't see that. You see these, these tremendous leaps in the capability that is offered through technology. And you see all those technologies down there, those are all offered through Intel. And again, taken into boxes, those boxes are stitched together into end-to-end -end solutions. You layer up software on top of it. And uh, there, there you have it. You have a, a deployable solution. It, it especially, this is especially true of the uh, smart cities and transportation space, uh, but broadly in other segments as well. It really takes a village. So no one company can come in and just solve it all, right? And and deploy solutions that that fit the bill, that allow you to accomplish the the objectives that you've set out to accomplish to better citizen outcomes and all that sort of stuff. So if you, if you look at this chart on the left, it's all the, uh, you, you have a, the solution, the, the technology stack, right? Silicon hardware, operating system, networking, orchestration software, data platforms, applications, it's the usual, you know, you see different versions of this, but the net is that you have all these different pieces. Now these, these pieces, uh, we are proud to have a robust ecosystem of system integrators, of OEMs and ODMs, telecoms providers, ISVs, and CSPs that really collaborate, that team up, that work with end customers to, to deliver these, these outcomes. So as we looked at sort of, you know, what is going on today, even ahead of the infrastructure bill uh, you know, it, it got passed, it takes a little time to kind of start seeing the money, but even today, uh, if you look at the initiatives across the U.S., Chicago, San Francisco, Seattle, Pittsburgh, New York, you have these citywide initiatives that, that uh, range from investments into transportation, into public safety, into waterways, into, into air pollution, all these sorts of things, and there's, there's a lot of detail behind this, um, there's links to, to the city pages that talk to, to the specific outcomes they're looking to drive, but these are major initiatives that are, that are going on across the country. There's a lot of global examples as well. Uh, in, in some senses, uh, uh, you know, places like China or Singapore or, or, you know, are moving quite quickly as well. Uh, they, they have a different funding structure, a different approach. There's pros and cons to it for sure. But um, the net message is there's a lot going on in this, in this space. Uh, Texas. Now, I'm sure that each of you, any of you can, can uh, tell me about these projects and tell me much more than I would be able to communicate to you. Uh, but Lubbock Smart Meters, the Austin Vision Zero, San Antonio Smart Lighting, Smart Dallas Plan, uh, Houston Smart City, uh, we, we just recently uh, had the honor and pleasure of, uh, of working with the city of Houston with Mayor Sylvester Turner, uh, who's been, who's been uh, just an amazing advocate for smart cities, for new technology and transforming the city. So uh, we're looking forward to, to I, I know that the Intel team works with, with all of you, but we're looking forward to kind of continue to work with you to step up the in level of engagement. Uh, especially as we all collectively have this, this opportunity to do more together. So we're looking forward to that. 
Uh, a couple of data points here with regards to, you know, the types of outcomes we could drive, right? So, so if you think about this digital transformation and not just think about physical infrastructure, but think about digital infrastructure, uh, you're talking about saving lives. So the Vision Zero initiative, right? So, so today you, we, we unfortunately lose over a million people every year in traffic accidents globally. And the intention uh, is to kind of take that down to, to zero, right? And we'd love to kind of collaborate with Texas to, to see Texas as a leading state, a leading advocate to make this happen. Giving back time. So this, this, is a, uh, this, this is actually a little bit, we did this a couple of years ago with a company called Juniper Research out in the UK where we looked at, hey, what are, what are the types of outcomes that smart cities technologies can really drive, can really make happen? And we got to a, you know, about 59.5 hours, I know it's a very specific number, but a couple, three weeks back in time, if we, if we sort of address uh, gridlock in, in, in traffic uh, in, and just other time optimization types of things, and uh, if you get that time back, you can do with it as you, as you wish. You can kind of take it to kind of de-stress a little bit or hang out with friends or it, it just sort of, you know, sitting in traffic is not the best way to, to spend time. So, so doing that and, and just uh, benefiting from that, that outcome, right? Reducing air pollution. As we reduce traffic, uh, there's one particular example that we see uh, that, that showcases that hey, maybe a 20% or so air pollution reduction just from, from reducing gridlock. So these are the types of outcomes that we want to drive, that we all want to drive uh, for us, right? Uh, and across many different sort of deployment use cases and ac across different, different opportunities, you have these, these, uh, these uh, citizen outcomes or these positive outcomes that can be driven. So this is, uh, uh, I, I've used this slide a fair bit where we'd go in and talk to cities and talk to agencies and so on and talk about, hey, how do you get started? Maybe you should start in a way that's kind of, kind of bite-sized and, and think about your stakeholders and think about creating a plan and think about, you know, uh, uh, just picking a suitable project. Uh, that, that with, with the infrastructure bill coming in the next, you know, and, and that becoming a reality in terms of available funding, Maybe this approach gets a little bit dated and we need to think about, okay, how do we develop a comprehensive plan quickly? Or maybe there's a comprehensive plan available and how do we prioritize uh, collectively the, the, the highest order bits to go work on, right? So, so uh, this would be something to think about. We at Intel are, are in the process. We've actually kicked off a uh, infrastructure bill, sort of a ebook type of thing. And I'm hoping that, you know, we're working, we're working at this as we speak, but I'm hoping that we can map the, uh, the, the types of things that the bill calls out as opportunities to, to, uh, to improve and enhance and map them to available partner solutions uh, and make it just, just a little bit easier for cities, for departments of transportation to think about, you know, hey, what's available out there if I want to go go do these things in a way that's digestible and, and consumable. We've got available ebooks as well, so we're happy to kind of um, share with them as, as, uh, as, as you're interested. And uh, we've got Brian Dietrich here in the room who is based in, in Dallas. So uh, between Brian and myself, we can kind of get these ebooks over to you. They pertain to a variety of different subjects. So these are available ebooks and available information and the infrastructure investment and jobs act ebook will i'm hoping be available sometime in q1 we're certainly going to work work hard to make that happen so superpower digital technologies these technologies can really augment the physical infrastructure build out and what you do with physical infrastructure so just keep that sort of as as one of the key things that you think about as you build out physical infrastructure and physical opportunities. Um, this looks like the last slide, but it's not. <laughs> so an adage that, that uh, I, I, I really liked uh, in, this, in the context of smart cities, but in, the, in many other contexts as well, is this, you know, think big. 
So not just smarter, but better cities. It's not about technology, right? Technology is a tool to make things happen. It's about citizens. It's about citizen outcomes. So, so think, think big. Think, have that big vision, right? But start small. Now, you, not, you may not need to start small anymore because of uh, you know, all this funding coming about. But smart small with projects and opportunities to kind of get rolling. Uh, but move fast and, and iterate and, and course correct as needed because it's hard to kind of get it right, get it perfect the first time around. So th these are, these are this, is, this is sort of how we are shaping up our business. This is what we talk about with partners and with, with customers as we look at the strategic sort of, you know, how do we get going in uh, creating better, smarter cities. So with that, thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity and thanks for having us here. And again, it's a pleasure to be in Austin and to be face to face after quite a while. So thank you. Thank you. Can you take a couple of questions? Uh, yeah, sure. All right. Let's try to stump Sajid now to thank him for being here. A couple of questions we can take okay. before we start the next event. Yeah. You can direct all the questions to Max. Max is on my team and uh, he takes questions. Go ahead. So the question was, um, uh, what, what may have surprised us as we embarked on this, this smart cities journey? And I've been working in this space personally for about five years. It's a great question, right? So um, the the huge sort of externality that happened, right, is, is COVID. And uh, so that, that was a huge shock, how that Won't be any major outbreaks and so on, but if there are, you know, the the thing, the uh, there's a lot of technologies that can help. So that that's I don't know if it's a surprise per se, but it's a realization for sure and just a something to kind of keep in the mix. Uh, another another piece that might be uh, something that I could, hadn't quite expected, right? There's this uh, there's this leapfrogging in in certain parts of the world in terms of technology deployment. And again, it's not all good because uh, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of reasons why we move in a little more of a deliberate pace in the States. Uh, and there's a lot of goodness to that as well. But it's something to think about, right? Uh, that when I first started in this space, that was a little bit surprising to me. The speed and the, just the, the uh, single-mindedness with which uh, certain parts of the world are, are moving forward in this space. No, absolutely. It, 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 yes, yes. Uh, so the question pertained to um, uh, the edge and how it's become a buzzword and uh, what are some use cases uh, that may pertain to the edge. Uh, so it certainly has uh, become a buzzword, that's for sure. It tends to happen in the tech sector, right? It's, uh, it's one thing or the other or something else, right? And uh, the edge does have a lot of, you know, just cachet today, right? And people like to talk about the edge. But there's a reason why, right? So, so there was the cloud, but you have so many high latency, or, or low latency, rather, uh, use cases that are out there, right? So pertaining to, to traffic especially, right? So, so uh, monitoring this, uh, p pedestrian safety, for example. That, uh, that really requires sort of that, that low latency type of a, a response. Uh, there's many, many others as well. And what's really changed is the capabilities, right? So uh, 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 I'm, I'm with Intel, so you know, uh, take, take this uh, and sort of interpret it the way you would like, 
Uh, but the capabilities in the silicon have grown so tremendously that offer up this opportunity to really deploy, deploy these, these edge capabilities anywhere you want at a interesting price point that allow for these, these use cases to get deployed. So the edge in our mind is real, the opportunity is real, and uh, computing will go from, you know, from cloud to edge, the cloud's gonna remain really a very, very robust, huge opportunity uh, to benefit, but the edge is real as well. And Sajid, Sajid, I'd like to add on to that a little bit. Yes. From, so wearing my day job hat at Dell Technologies, we have a strong edge computing strategy as well. And as Sajid said, sometimes it's a question of, of literally it's latency. The nanoseconds matter. You don't want the cloud having to make the decision whether to stop the autonomous vehicle. The vehicle needs to make that decision as soon as it gets the data on there's an obstruction ahead, right? The latency to connect to that cloud, it make the decision, infer what you should do, and then relay it back. That could be life and death. So there are some strict latency ones. There's also some uh, cost ones. Sometimes it is cheaper to deploy many edge devices, uh, computing devices, than just edge sensors and a centralized computing thing. Um, there are also some resiliency uh, issues there as well, where you may want distributed edge computing devices for res resiliency, so you don't have one decision point going down. You have millions of decision points, and if one of those goes down, you have failover in that regard as well. So there's some, uh, also the co uh, communications fabric could be part of it. Even if the decision wasn't nanosecond dependent, it was maybe just second dependent or millisecond dependent, it still doesn't do you any good if the uh, communications fabric is down. So there's at least four reasons that we see certain environments are going to be uh, embrace edge computing, but ultimately it's gonna come down to those factors of uh, can I withstand resiliency of A or B, and what is the cost of A or B? And so a good example of this is hospitals, which have a whole bunch of different met, uh, imaging modalities. And should they send the images to the cloud to be analyzed and then receive the results back? Or should they analyze them at the hospital right where they collect? And it's actually a trickier question than you think, because for an x-ray, I mean, when's the last time your doctor needed the x-ray result in a nanosecond, right? They still have to walk down the hallway anyway, so they don't need it in a nanosecond. Cloud might be better, but for precision surgery kinds of things, well, then it matters. Then, then edge matters more. So there's a lot of you know, situations where there are real concrete differences and others where it's more of an optimization. We probably should wrap there, Sajid. Can you stay around and talk to people at the next break? Uh, yeah, we'll be leaving in a few minutes though. Oh, okay. A little bit, but, you, but uh, we can certainly reach back out to us and we have a quick, quick discussion here with a, with a few folks and we'll try to stick around for a bit. And so. Sajid's colleague, Brian Dietrich, is right here in front. He's a member of the Austin Smart City Alliance Board of Directors too, and he's gonna be here the rest of the afternoon, Brian? Great, all right. Thank you very much, Sajid. One more round Thank of you. applause. For